Chris White, CTO at Prefect, and prior to that, he was at Capital One, where he was a data science manager and a principal data scientist. Welcome to the Data Exchange Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to excited to dive in. And uh, today, I'm turning the mic over to Jen Webb, our managing editor, and she will uh, drive our conversation. Take it away, Jen. Thank you, Ben, and I uh, look forward to, to chatting with you today, Chris. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk uh, about Prefect and about workflow management, but I first wanted to start with a little background. So you were a data scientist at Capital One. Um, how did you end up working on a, a workflow management tool? That is a great question. So I'm going to take go back one step further into my history at Capital One. So when I started, I very much was building predictive models. So like that was my job essentially, was building and justifying those predictive models. And then over the course of my tenure at Capital One, I got a little bit deeper into the stack. So I kind of first order transition was building tooling for my you know local team to help them iterate quicker in a, in a slightly more principled way and document a lot of their experiments better. So that was kind of one phase. And then by the time I left, I was working on essentially a platform where data scientists would deploy their models to, and then business analysts were actually the main users of the platform, but it gave them this first class access to the models that data scientists were building. Um, and so the reason I kind of give you a little bit of that history is in the course of that kind of moving back into the stack, I got really involved in a Python tool called Dask, which probably heard of distributed computing, uh, you know, a lot of interesting companies now spinning up around the Dask ecosystem, but so started, you know, becoming a contributor to, to the Dask project, building some side projects uh, with Matt Rocklin, who is the creator of Dask. And that, so then I wrote a blog post um, about Dask at Capital One on our particular team. By total chance, uh, Jeremiah came across that blog post because as you may or may not know, Prefect definitely was built with Dask as a first class citizen. So Dask was like very much in mind from day one and is one of the motivating have, reasons for I have Prefect. to talk yeah. you I have to talk you into using Ray too. Oh, totally, totally open to Ray. There's a couple of open issues right now about Ray integrations, and I've actually spoken with, with a few people on the Ray team about this. So yeah, like I, definitely on our mind. Full disclosure, um, I'm yeah. an advisor to any scale. Oh, very cool. Very, very cool. Yeah. No, totally, totally uh, open and interested in that. I think the execution model is slightly different in a way that makes it a little tricky, but we're, you know, kind of thinking about what that might look like. Actually, yeah, and Chris, Chris, before you get deeper into that, so what's interesting about Jen's question is uh, data scientists in many companies in the past didn't even write their own pipelines, number one. Number number two, right. they definitely didn't write their own tools. So, right. So the isn't the stereotype that data scientists code is good enough for laptop notebook, but definitely not something that uh, for production, right? So yes. So there's a few things there at Capital One. Uh, a lot of credit to Capital One. Really cool tech community inside of Capital One. And, you know, this is definitely still true there, but there was a really large contingent of data scientists who were super interested in bringing software engineering best practices to, you know, our internal tooling. And so that was like top of mind in a lot of discussions at Capital One. And I kind of found myself involved with that group. So that was like how I got into true soft, pure software development. And what you're saying is 100% true. You know, our team that was working on this platform, most of them were data scientists by trade. We had ETL pipelines, you know, keeping the data fresh in the back end and like had all sorts of problems with that. And so kind of through that experience, plus our user base of business analysts who are not particularly technical and DAS, all of that kind of came together to make Jeremiah and I's first few conversations really interesting um, all, for the reason you're saying too, which is that my user for the product we were working on internally were non-technical. So we had to figure out how to get them this like powerful thing, but not let them mess it up too much. Um, or like, you know, spend a lot of money in AWS or whatever the case may be. And so, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of the short story of how I met Jeremiah. And then we just started riffing on design ideas, how Bass could fit into Prefect better. 
um, what the interface looks like to make it more intuitive. And it just, by pure chance, we had like exactly the same design considerations. And one other thing that I want to call out because it became, I think, a part of our culture is that we also, in a lot of our early disagreements, found like all of our disagreements were incredibly healthy in the sense that they always ended with one of us learning something new. And so that's a kind of part of, you know, something that we tried to bake into our culture, not even just our engineering culture, which is this idea that disagreement is totally fine. Revisiting your assumptions is a healthy thing to do. And there are ways of doing that in a really healthy way. And it, you know, if you do it right, always results in furthering both the product and, you know, you as a, as a person. So for potential new founders, what made you, like, how did you know it was, it was, it was time to, to break away from your job and start your new thing? So that, it's a really good question. I, I have a few answers that are like very crisp specific. And so I don't know if they apply to everyone. I have the little mantra to always make interesting decisions. So that was always in the back of my head. Um, of course, you know, you can't apply that in every single situation. You have to be a little mindful. Um, but I do enjoy taking risks, especially when the risk means betting on myself, which is really what this, you know, what it is when you join a company of two people. Um, and then the second thing, you know, to be completely honest, is just Jeremiah's vision, both for the tool as a technical thing, but also for the business, I just found really compelling in a way that I was surprised by. I, I wouldn't say that historically I was a particularly strong business thinker. I have a degree in economics. So like, you know, I, I know a few things, but I didn't ever really like incorporate that into my day to day. And he, he thinks about things in a way that I've just found incredibly compelling. And so I just was really intrigued. I didn't make the decision overnight. It took a long time, a lot of back and forth. And then eventually I, you know, was a hundred percent sold and, and jumped on board. Actually, uh, uh, Jen, uh, taking a step back. Um, so obviously the elephant in the room, airflow. You were in Capital One. You were probably uh, writing pipelines. Maybe airflow was in the equation. Uh, um, homegrown. Homegrown. For okay. our team, at least. So then, uh, oh, so, so at that point, uh, then it makes sense. So, so you created this homegrown workflow orchestration and management tool. And uh, you, you must have looked at what airflow was doing, right? So to, to figure out uh, to figure out what could be improved and what was missing? Yeah, so I definitely did. And we'll probably get into this a little later, so I won't go too deep on it, no. but it was so heavy for what we needed to do. We just did not need, and we didn't want to be spinning up, you know, five different services just to make sure our pipeline ran every day. Um, so that's the reason we avoided it. And then probably worth mentioning here, Jeremiah was one of the main contributors to Airflow. For a long time, he was the you know, second most active contributor. He was on the PMC. So a lot of his oh, you know, vision too came very directly from the problems with Airflow. That's interesting because both Max and Jeremiah didn't uh, continue down Airflow. <laughs> there are probably reasons for that. Wink, wink. <laughs> so Jen, Max is the main uh, creator of uh, Airflow, but uh, um, actually, in your in your announcement post of Prefect, there's a line in there. I forget the exact uh, wording. Something along the lines that you know, if we do this right, uh, when you're writing code on your laptop, you wouldn't even think of an orchestration or workflow management tool, right? So yes. I love that philosophy. Actually, yeah. Yeah, the, the goal, and, you know, of course, is ambitious and probably not exactly what is achievable, but the idea is that data scientists don't want to think about pipelines or data engineers, like none of them want to think about pipelines. They want to think about their business objective and writing code to achieve that objective. And if we can just tuck into that code in as minimal of a way as possible um, and give you all sorts of interesting observability, retry, orchestration, ability to run tasks in different locations on different schedules, whatever the case may be, an API over that, you know, what starts as a script, um, then we've done our job well because we don't want to be getting in the way. And we also don't want to force you to reinvent the world the way we see it. 
Now, of course, there's a little bit of give and take there on both sides, but that's that's the dream. Well, let's jump into uh, some of the design considerations. So obviously Airflow was out there and um, you had deep experience with it, um, or Jeremiah did. Uh, so what were like, what were the, the very first uh, most important um, aspects of the, the tool that, that you absolutely had to have? The three biggest ones that really started the whole discussion and you know thinking of prefect were first class parameterization. So what I mean by this, is like in Airflow, there are these things called variables. You can basically hack them. The scheduler runs that logic, which is just kind of a bad you know, set of uh, mixing of concerns. And so you can get there, but they're not first class and you can't send something from the outside to affect you know, a parameter change. So just the ability to do that, that immediately leads to the ability to pass data in an in-memory first class way. So that was another consideration. Um, Runs off schedule is a really big one, making that really intuitive and transparent. You know, there's kind of a meme about airflow scheduled start time versus execution date. And it's like kind of complicated to reason about. It makes a lot of yeah, sense because it was that, built. That, that's right? confusing. <laughs> it's incredibly confusing. And like, don't get me wrong. There were reasons for this, right? Yeah. Airflow is, you know, a decade old tool at this point. There were really good reasons, but like none of it makes sense anymore. Um, so just that, that ad hoc ability while potentially having a schedule still attached. And then last but not least was just scale. So, you know, data science background, a lot of the things that I wanted to do was track experiments. Like I said, on, the, on that first team I was on, that was one of the big things we were trying to do. And so bookkeeping those experiments, which could involve tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of individual tasks that I want orchestrated, I wanted that to happen quickly. And, you know, a tool like Airflow, which is designed for Hadoop jobs, can run, I think they think on the order of, you know, one couple of tasks per minute. And I wanted to be thinking about tens of tasks per second that I was submitting to something. Hey, and so, uh, and there's a lot of other things, but those are the three really big drivers that informed a lot of our main feature set. Chris, uh, to put just uh, workflow management and orchestration in context, uh, what would have, so a, co a company like Capital One or a similar size company without workflow management and orchestration, would it be able to function? That is a really good question. My, it would, but at a really huge cost. And I have not seen a single company, large or small, that functions without some version of a workflow management tool. Might be just some open source tool they pulled off the shelf. Most of the time, though, it's something that is homegrown. And there, are, I can go into a long story of reasons for why I think that is. Um, but most of the time it's homegrown solutions. And Prefect is, is the intended purpose of Prefect is to um, take that lift off of the, those teams so they don't have to homegrow something. Exactly. Um, we, yeah. No, go ahead. Just we view that we, we kind of have this, this split of the world that uh, we use to define our problem space into negative engineering and positive engineering. Positive engineering is the, the thing you want to achieve. Run the experiment, get the results, uh, get the data landed in your data warehouse on time, whatever the case may be. And then negative engineering is exactly all of that prep you end up maintaining to make sure that task occurs. And the task itself is already hard. That's why you got hired. And then you end up going down these rabbit holes of scheduling dependency management, APIs, observability, you know, the list goes on and on. And so we want to remove all of that from you and let you focus on the things that matter to your business, which are really diverse at the end of the day. So, so Chris, in my mind, uh, workflow management tool, there's a few main parts, right? So like you said, there's the scheduler, there's the executor, uh, there's some sort of metadata store just to store state. But then actually the, the part where the... Uh, but the tool creators and the users kind of rhapsodize about is the dashboard, right? So having, because basically once you have a lot of these DAGs, you want to have a nice slick dashboard. So um, is that right? Is that a right description of a workflow management tool? Scheduler, executor, metadata, and, and dashboard. 
I think that is a lot of it, but I do think that there's one big piece that's missing from that, uh, from those like building blocks and that's business great, yeah. logic. Okay, right. Uh, workflows are always at the level of a business objective, an experiment, a data movement, you know, from of the last day's worth of data. There's always some sort of sentence you can say and there are lots of rules around the workflow. So like, I need an alert if it fails. I need a report sent. I need uh, the data that was you know generated tracked. And that's kind of a little bit of the metadata side, but like there's a lot of business logic that you also want to encapsulate. Who is allowed to see it and not see it? Who is allowed to trigger it and not trigger it? All of that stuff too, I think is, is the fourth, I guess, pillar, if you will. So what about, so the, the, you know, when you think of data, right? So just data, set aside pipelines and DAGs. So kind of the enterprise features are governance, uh, versioning, security, uh, search and discoverability. Do, do those same enterprise features exist for pipelines? Uh, absolutely. Um... So one of the ways that we've split the world is with something that we've called our hybrid model, which is not particularly descriptive, but the idea is that the tool that we, you know, offer up on GitHub, open source tool is called Prefect. It's an engine or a workflow builder. And it's your, it's your dev experience. You, you work on your workflow, you build it, you run it locally. All that's great. But once again, there's business logic that's lurking around in terms of what you're trying to achieve. And so the actual uh, product that we sell is Prefect Cloud, and it's an API that your workflows are configured to talk to and communicate with in various ways. And so that behind that API is where all of the things you just mentioned live in Prefect's world. And so audit logs, did someone turn this schedule off? Who turned the schedule off? Was there a reason for it? Um, did they have, you know, preventing someone from being able to turn the schedule off? A permissioning feature. All of that stuff is stuff we put behind the API. And then you own your execution environment because the amount of diversity in execution environments is extreme. And you know that's, that's, that's a job for a DevOps team. And so given how things are at the moment, is there anything you would have changed about the design up until this point? No, so it's, without it's, getting, perfect. it's perfect. <laughs> it's prefect. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a cheap one. Uh, so yes, there definitely are. And I, I won't get ahead of myself because I know, I know we'll probably end up talking a little bit more about roadmap. Um, but 100%, I think that the split that we perceived in this negative engineering, positive engineering, however you want to view it, was visceral enough that our product today is you know a bunch of kind of amalgamation of features that have emerged from our community and things you know from our own uh, from our customers, and a lot of the design and how they fit together can sometimes be counterintuitive, and the onboard experience to access some of those features can also be a little uh, have a little friction, and we're totally aware of that, and a lot of that goes all the way down to the core fundamental design building blocks. And you know, we can talk more about exactly what I mean by, by some of this, but there are definitely things that I would revisit. And I guess what I'm building up to is we're going to revisit them for the second half of the year. That is a big uh, focus for us in the second half. So, so Chris, when it comes to pipelines, so, so pipelines, ML, uh, data applications, they're software, so, uh, but they're more complicated than, than uh, regular software. But uh, uh, since they're software, then you have kind of, there's lessons from software engineering about how people build software, right? So you've got development, testing, uh, unit testing, integration testing, those kinds of things. Then you deploy, can you, how do you roll back if there's a problem, right? So how do you safely deploy, then monitoring. Uh, so I hate to bring this up, but the Dagster guys seem to have mm. articulated this well in terms of their stages in building a pipeline. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, 
and uh, uh, they've positioned their tool so that uh, they can help at each stage, right? So developing, testing, deploy, monitoring, observability. I imagine you folks do this too, but you haven't uh, you haven't ex explicitly uh, explained prefect this way, right? No, and there's a reason for that. So the reason is that that isn't solving a problem. I would argue that is not solving a business problem. Testability, version control, all of that should just be a default assumption of whatever you're doing. And so we do, we did build Prefect with that as a first class system. And that's the reason, for example, just comparing with Airflow, that you can run a workflow in an interactive terminal with Prefect. Whereas with Airflow, you have to spin up the scheduler and do all this other stuff. The idea of that is you can write tests for it. You can mock your tasks, you can mock your task states, you can test your retry functionality. You know, we have a lot of dev tooling around that. And you are correct. We haven't, you know, made a big to-do about it because the business problem we're solving is slightly different from that. And that is just what I think everyone expects from any software tool is the ability to do those things. Um, and so, so yeah, that's that's kind of the reasoning there for, for why so, that's not our so in other headline. words, so so the the workflow in the workflow, you don't explicitly call out these stages. Right. And one of the things, and I guess this actually is an interesting point uh, or time to talk about exactly how we develop our product, um, because you're calling something out that, okay, so let me, let me take a step back. We have a just massive community of a really, really active users. And what I mean by that is if you join our Slack community, it's, you know, rapid fire question and answers happening there. And so there's a lot of learning that we get from that. And then we have, you know, really uh, fast paced uh, quarterly business reviews with all of our customers. So we're really big on collecting user uh, feedback. And what are the problems that you're solving? Can, does your use case fit into our vocabulary? Yes or no? And all of that good stuff. So the reason I say that is one thing that we try to do is we really try to release features in an unopinionated way first to see what happens. So I can give you a really specific uh, example here. We initially released the concept of a prefect agent, which is the thing that deploys your workflows in this way where a Kubernetes agent could, for example, submit an AWS ECS task for the workflow. So like there's this weird mixing of, of infrastructure. And we did that just to see, maybe there's a use case that we're not thinking about that needs this. Turns out, unsurprisingly, Nobody needed that. And everyone was paralyzed with choice when they showed up. So they're like, which agent do I need and which run config do I need? And we're right. like, we don't have an opinion. And then, you know, they struggled a little bit, but then in watching those struggles and getting the feedback and, you know, hand holding a lot of the users through those first stages, we learned what people did in fact want. And then we went back and we hardened it. And so this, this movement of your pipeline through stages is another example of one of those things. We do currently have an opinionated approach to that using something we call labels that dictate where your flow runs. So you can, you know, promote your flow through different environments by changing its label. And, you know, if you're an enterprise customer, you get audit logs for these things and all that fun stuff. Um, and it turns out, you know, that while that does work, there are even more things that our users want hardened as a concept. And so that's another one of those things that will be you know, it's not going to be drastically different, but it'll be more of a hardened concept instead of this kind of loose, just change the label idea. It'll be like actually like upgrade your deployment, for example, might be the verbiage of it. So what are some of the um, business problems you are solving? What are some use cases that uh, you can share with us? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, the two that are the unsurprising bread and butter are regularly scheduled ETL batch jobs ton of people using it for that. And to be completely honest, most of those people are, so Prefect Cloud has a really generous free tier. You can run 10,000 tasks a month on it. And a lot of those batch use cases fall right into that. So no need to you know do anything else there. Uh, another one that is starting to venture into the more interesting side are data science uh, experiment bookkeeping. So you, know, you have these workflows, they don't have any schedule attached to them. They're purely meant for ad hoc purposes. So you you go, you know, you have one person who maybe builds the workflow, maybe even a data analyst who actually uses it. So they go to the UI, they have a nice description of how to interact with it, what the parameters mean, and they can sit there, you know, poking around and getting these like kind of large scale things to run. 
Um, so that's, that's another one. Some more like I personally find fascinating, but probably not particularly widespread use cases. So we have one client who, so this label functionality that I was mentioning, you can schedule a workflows labels to change at certain times. And in that scheduling functionality, you can also say, I want this workflow to run in 10 different places all simultaneously. And you do that by creating 10 runs, each with their own set of labels. And we have some, we have one client specifically that's using that to actually produce build artifacts on multiple operating systems, but with one piece of Python logic, which I just find really fascinating. I think it's a really cool use case of the scheduler. Um, and then kind of similarly, we have some other use cases that you can also schedule your parameter values to change. And so we have some other use cases where you just have these large parameterized movement of data that is in basically parameterized by infrastructure. And so submitting those jobs out to multiple locations simultaneously and being able to track them as independent, you know, runs of the same piece of business logic is, a, is another big one. Um, and, you know, like all there's tons of variations in each of those. It's kind of like a disservice to a lot of their use cases to say, well, it's just ETL batch. Like every one of them is unique. And that's just another reason that Prefect is meant to be minimal in terms of how it interacts with your code. Because like, if you take too strong of opinions on how someone's supposed to talk to a database, you're going to cut out 25% of your users that talk to their database in some other potentially bizarre way. And we like, we try not to get too in the way of that. So quick question, you and uh, Jeremiah are uh, developers, engineers, you're not UX people. So what kinds of uh, things to, uh, in, on the UX side have you had to, uh, are you proud of in terms of innovation? Because I, I described, uh, so for example, Airflow users really loved uh, Airflow UX uh, for its ability to give them a snapshot of their DAGs and the state of their DAGs. But that's one view. So did you have to like uh, innovate on the UX as well? So we definitely did to a certain extent. And I think we got a long way based on the fact that we're developers who have opinions about developer tools. Um, and so, you know, the UI is very functional right now, but one of one of the things a part of our roadmap as well, and like as a little quick side note, I'm going to mention our next six months multiple times, not as a cop out, but we just raised uh, a really healthy Series B, and the, one of the big purposes of that raise is to execute on some of these kind of revisits of you know the product. So just throwing that out there. Um, so we did get a long way on developer intuition for the UI. I won't even, you know, I won't sugarcoat it. There's definitely things in the UI that I find frustrating. Yeah, uh, yeah, the schematic sure, sure. view, you know, yeah. Uh, it, when you have a lot of DAGs, I don't know how much, uh, you know, because uh, there's a whole community of HCI UX people, right? So I wonder if there's, they have ideas for how to present that, right? Yeah, we're definitely not too pinned to the DAG concept there. But we are, we do have a, you know, a design uh, team contracted right now. We're like very actively working on wireframes for a complete redesign of the UI. And we're, we're treading carefully and principally um, to make sure that we're really thinking about not hardening any patterns that might just be ephemeral, you know, historical, maybe they're just like multi-month patterns that aren't going to like persist in you know three years or something so you mentioned the uh, oops sorry Jen. oh go ahead you mentioned batch etl what about streaming that is a great question so we we do have some users who have hooked up some streaming type of solutions to prefect usually this involves long-running tasks and or kicking off really high frequency workflow jobs. So remember, we have this API that allows you to trigger jobs ad hoc. You can trigger a hundred jobs. Uh, actually this week, um, without naming any names, we have a, a bioinformatics company. To be clear, I don't exactly know the details of what their workloads are doing. They told us that it is the largest workload in the bioinformatics space of this kind. 
hopefully we'll learn some more details about what that exactly means, but they are firing off something like uh, 10,000 jobs a minute right now, workflows a minute. Um, and so that's one way you can kind of get streaming and prefect today, but that isn't quite a first class streaming concept. And so one of the things that we're really digging into, and we're, we're being a little careful here because streaming means so many different things to so many different people. And we have to be, we don't want to like pick the wrong way people are interpreting it. But for us, streaming is starting, it's starting to emerge that all streaming really means is attaching an event to a workflow at some frequency that is definitely sub minute. So the workflow is running more than once a minute for sure. And it's attached to some event. Now, right now, prefect workflows are submitted as jobs where I say jobs in quotes or with a capital J because it depends on the platform. But so for example, Kubernetes job, ECS task, uh, sub process, but it's heavy. It's something that you probably don't want to run, you know, a hundred times a minute, unless you have an absolutely massive Kubernetes cluster or something. And so infrastructure reuse is like what I'm building up to here. If we can get the infrastructure reuse case nailed down, then this streaming situation that is currently kind of bolted on can become an actual first class thing where like, you're not just tracking your events through the parameter on your workflow. You're actually tracking it through a first class event stream that Prefect knows about. Um, so yeah, so streaming, I guess the, the, the short summary here is people do streaming in Prefect today by just using our building blocks, but it's not quite a first-class citizen yet. But I think we're, we're circling the drain with some of our, our customers on exactly what that means for Prefect. Like, what does it mean to retry one of these? There's like little questions like that we have to work through, but. Well, really quick uh, follow-up question to what Ben was asking about the UX. One of the things that we see in like AI model training and development is people having to develop um, for people across a company, um, people who might need the business intelligence reports, um, analysts who might not speak data science, that kind of thing. Are you finding have, that you're having to build your tool for non-developers? And how much so of a we challenge is that? Yeah, it's a really good question. We definitely have non-developers, 100%. The idea of permissioning roles on our enterprise clients is just a big deal. Read-only roles and more weird, granular, custom versions of that. Um, so we definitely have to keep them in mind. Kind of, you know, e even these people that I think us as engineers tend to think of as non-technical, they're still decently technical, right? Because they're reasoning about data. They're just not technical in the sense that they can, you know, uh, cherry pick Git commits or something like that. And so one of our goals, and once again, I'm not necessarily going to claim that we've completely solved it today, but it's definitely a first class goal is we want Prefect to be accessible to the junior developers and the most senior. And one way that we do that is through uh, hopefully good naming conventions and really sensible defaults for things that are still deeply configurable. If you want to go really deep into them, by all means, but if you don't provide any configuration, we'll do something that makes sense still um, and is hopefully not confusing. And so a silly example here, the idea of naming it a flow with tasks. The fact that we didn't create some bizarre new vocabulary for what these things are already gets us a really long way because when you talk to a business analyst or someone, you know, some non-technical stakeholder, they're like, I basically know what that means. Flow, workflow, that's clever. And a task, I mean, everyone kind of knows what a task is. And so, you know, and that can be, you know, you have to be careful. You have to make sure that your abstraction doesn't leak into some bizarre, completely general, meaningless thing. But, you know, def definitely think about it. And I like to think that we have done at least a decent job of that. Let's go ahead and uh, jump into your, your roadmap and where you currently are and what are the, the big things that you're looking at over this six month period you were talking about and even longer down the road. Yeah, tell us how you're spending this series B, man. So. Well, first off, hiring. So if anyone is out there <laughs> and loves anything that we're talking about from UI to Python to DevOps to SREs, I mean, we're hiring across the board. So that's that's one big one. Um, okay, so I terms of the next six months roadmap, there's some things that we're kind of 
you know, being a little sheltered about. So let me answer the question, not by giving you like super, super specific features, like listed features, but I'll tell you some motivating questions that we, that are driving us. So one motivating question, and this kind of ties in to a lot of different things. So one of our most popular features is this thing called task mapping. Um, the concept is relatively intuitive. It's you have a task, it takes some input. And you want this task to run multiple times with lots of different input values. And because that's data that's going into the task, you don't know how many times it's going to happen when you build your workflow. And so you go task.map, you feed it another task that returns an iterable. And next thing you know, we spawn first class task runs that are independently retriable, independently visible, have their own IDs, et cetera, et cetera. So that feature we built you know, on day one and it was really popular. Turns out it was crazy popular for scale. So we have people running, you know, task mapping on the order of hundreds of thousands of things they're mapping over. And that scale, kind of going back to the UI, UI starts to, it doesn't, doesn't fall over, but it's just clunky. You're like, I need to see into these 200,000 things in this one workflow. And, you know, you kind of get this like really basic summary statistic right now, just failures and things, but really drilling deeper becomes hard just because there's so much stuff. And so scale is kind of the, the one of the big motivating questions and really scale from the UI perspective. The software itself works fine. The UI becomes confusing and we want to make sure that we provide more analytic dashboards so that you can ask questions of tasks at that volume, like histograms cut by tag and, you know, things like that. So that's, that's one really big motivating uh, uh, question. And that's really on the design side and analytics side. Another one, uh, and this is the one that I find the most fun is if you really think about it, DAGs are an artifact of YAML. The whole reason any engineer knows what a directed acyclic graph is is because that was the paradigm that emerged when people transitioned from YAML config to workflows as code. And we have a lot of users who, not asking necessarily in this precise of vocabulary, but essentially are asking like, why do I have to build a DAG first before I can run this thing? And we, have the same question. Why is that a fact of the world right now in the pipeline space and workflow space? And you know, people will give you reasons and things, but I don't find most of them convincing. I think it's a historical artifact. And I think that DAGs are essentially a legacy piece of terminology. And so, you know, breaking that mold is a very, I will just say motivating problem for us right now. So wait, so you're not saying that, uh, uh... The solution is YAML files, is it? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> no, no, no. YAML files are useful for some things, but not for building arbitrary <laughs> workflows. Uh, hey, uh, actually, uh, quick follow-up for the listeners who are not familiar with uh, this topic uh, in detail. When you talk about task mappings, uh, can you give some uh, concrete reasons why these come into play? Yeah, 100%. Like uh, examples, really, examples of applications or whatever, right? So. Yeah, hundred percent. So the mo the easiest, the easiest example is every hour I want to move some data from S3 into my data warehouse. You know, transform it, make sure it matches the schema, put it in my warehouse. Okay. The catch though is each hour different amounts of files are showing up in S3. Historically. You batch them and the whole batch is a part of the task, right? You transform the whole, you pull it all at once, you transform it all at once and you upload it all at once. That's okay, but when things go wrong, you now are responsible for making sure you had sufficient logging and retry functionality to know like, wait, which piece of this batch was bad? And so what people do in Prefect is they will, you know, the first thing that happens is they pull all the file names and then the rest of their pipeline is a sequence of dot map calls. So they create these parallel pipelines, each one processing a file. And you can change uh, your task run names based on data. And so people will name each task run, you know, the file name hyphen transform or whatever, the, whatever naming convention they want. And now 
A lot of the data still potentially, you know, depends on how they configured if they upload each one individually or eventually collect it back and batch it. But either way, you have this visibility at the file level into what's going on. And so a lot of it is, is just observability. Another reason using the same use case is maybe they don't know how to parallelize things. And so they might have to spin up, you know, a thread pool or process pool. There's all sorts of ways they could do it. But if you use Prefect with Dask, if we find parallelism in the structure of your workflow, you get parallelism. And so now your workflow potentially runs a lot faster, plus you get this observability. And I guess to make what I said before too about this like DAG as a legacy model, to make that a little bit more concrete, just so I'm not like, you know, spouting uh, philosophy here, mapping is one of them. That's a dynamic, you know, situation. But you can think a lot of the times we've seen developers who are really encouraged because Prefect is ultimately incredibly Pythonic. And you can sometimes get fooled into writing really, really like Python code with your tasks. And so while loops over tasks, generators over tasks, tasks that create other tasks because there's some sort of runtime you know, thing that is really baked into the definition, all of uh, dynamic conditionals, all of those things are the types of things that I'm, I'm thinking about. So... Uh, quick question. So the topic of observability has come up a few times. So uh, to what extent, so aspirationally, this workflow management space, particularly Prefect, what's the aspiration in that area in terms of, because uh, uh, to in my mind, anything with the word ops has three components, right? So uh, automation, monitoring, and incident response. So to what extent is the incident response, you know, if I see something in the UX that oh, this looks like it's in trouble, can I do root cause and go fix something? What's the aspiration of Prefect in terms of helping me uh, do that? Two, two lines of attack there. And, you know, maybe there's another one up again, but two that immediately come to my mind. The first is just this idea that when something fails and you know about it and you visit our dashboard, you should be something like two clicks away from at least isolating where that failure began. Of course, we can't tell you, oh, hey, you wrote this code wrong. You know, that might be a little too ambitious, but we can at least point you like this line caused some problem. Maybe you should go check that out. So that's one thing, just this idea that you can click through and find at what I would say the business logic you know, level where something went wrong. From the UX. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. And so yeah, failure, you'll, you'll, one of the ways that we give our demos is like, we show you what failure looks like because that's where Prefect's interesting. When things are going right, you shouldn't care about Prefect. You shouldn't know that we exist. But when things go wrong, you should be able to figure it out. And so we always demo failure whenever we, we demo. Um, another thing that I think is more interesting and more you know, potentially unique to how we've structured uh, Prefect Cloud is we have this thing called the automation suite. And the idea is, it's essentially if this, then that logic that you can configure for your workflows. And there's a lot of different you know, predicates you can use and outcomes you can use. And we're continually expanding that library based on user feedback from our community and our customers. Um, but one of the things you can do is if a flow fails, then do this thing. And you can configure multiple things. So notifications are obviously a big one, pager duty, text, straight up texting, whatever. But other kind of more interesting ones are you can kick off other workflows when something fails. You can turn your schedule off when something fails. You can pause all work across your tenant when something fails. Like all sorts of interesting orchestration actions that allow you to, you know, respond to that failure in whatever way makes the most sense for your for the use case. So we'll prefect 4.0, Chris. Uh help me predict or anticipate failure in advance? <laughs> 4.0, we're more <laughs> ambitious than that, Ben. It'll you, be more, it'll be a before 4.0. Using <laughs> ML, right? So using ML, right? So you're about to press press. Don't do that, Ben. <laughs> One of the things we like to say is that we're experts in the signals that you can glean from workflow metadata. And so we will put that claim to the test, hopefully sooner than 4.0. <laughs> so what would be the manifestation? How would that play out? Um, so absolutely would be wired up to the automation suite. So if some threshold of some prediction is crossed, then do any action under the sun, whether it's an API action or an alert. 
That's one thing. Uh, probably the more interesting one would be, so like that would be in the realm of proactive action and alerting. But I think another thing that, that could be really interesting is just displaying trends for you in the UI. So this is just like, you're in the UI, you're poking around, you're asking yourself questions and we maybe help you uh, predict, you know, X, Y, Z. There's, you know, a lot of questions you might, you might ask based on the metadata that you're sending us. But predictive alerting is of course the, the like first order that's definitely something people are going to want. And would that be customized to, uh, would people be able to customize that for themselves? Yeah, a hundred, a hundred percent. And like, you know, there's different things that you can't customize and can customize, but that's kind of the whole, or I shouldn't say the whole, but that's one of the big aspects of the data model that we have in cloud of your metadata you can easily filter it. You can easily, you know, segment it by different uh, meaningful groups and things like that. And so a lot of these alerts, you could absolutely cut and slice in those same ways and say like, I want this alert only for this slice of workflows or, you know, only things that have this tag associated with them or whatever the case may be. Right. Um, well, we are quickly running out of time. Wow. Ben, do you have... Uh... So yeah, any, so any deep uh, in the weeds questions for Chris. <laughs> no, no, quick question on uh, data pipelines themselves and data ops, Chris. So uh, any remaining sources of frustration? Uh, as you know, now you're no longer you're a tool builder, but what's your sense? What's your sense talking to people? What are people frustrated about? Uh, when you say people, you you mean users? And users, yeah, 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 yeah. Not not with yeah. Prefect, not with prefect, but just the state of pipelines and data ops and you know what I mean, data engineering. So yeah, yeah, it, it's a good question. I don't I don't have a really like bite sized answer, but there's two two things that come up without you know in implicit ways. One is I think there's a lot of tools that show up that don't clarify the problem they're solving. And I actually think, and I'm not going to name names, I think there's a lot of tools and companies that are claiming to solve one problem, but are actually solving a separate problem quite well, but they don't realize it. And so you end up like, I'm going to make this up. You end up with uh, something that's pitching itself as an ETL tool, but it's actually a DevOps tool that is forcing data engineers to use a half-baked ETL framework. And like... That's just kind of a, you know, right. simplified e example, if you will. Um, so that's, that's one thing is just articulating what problem are you solving? Like the idea of building a pipeline is not a problem. You know, that's just like a little bit of boilerplate integration code. That's, that's not solving a problem for someone. And, you know, it saves you a couple minutes of time, but like that's not, you don't build a business off of that. Um, so that, that's one thing that I think this space could, could use a little more clarity on when, when new tools show up. And I guess... Kind what of about this, uh, what yeah. about Chris? The whole uh, you know software engineering uh, is is a much much older. Uh, there's more set practices, but ML, AI, data pipelines, relatively newer in many ways, right? So also more complex. So you know, I guess tools like Prefect allow you to inject rigor but uh, we're nowhere near at that level of other parts of software, right? Correct. The one, so I really am glad that you call this out. I absolutely think software engineering best practices apply to data. Right. However, right. forcing that down the user's throat is not solving a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the it one thing that I think and, I see a lot of people doing is like, you can now do this best practice. And it's like, sure, but you need to solve a problem. You need to meet users where they are. And so like a lot of the notebook companies, for example, I find interesting because they own that. They're like, you know what? These people are writing notebooks. Let's help them do that better and solve a problem. And then secretly they're doing version control, environment management, et cetera. And so I find that really Get cool. Them off of notebooks and into uh, IDE, man. <laughs> I, uh, have you seen uh, Hex is a really interesting one. Oh, really? They... they I don't want to call it an IDE. That's that's not probably correct, but they're bridging SQL and Python and one like notebook like experience. It's version controlled along with the data, and then you can produce these shareable apps that you can hand to non technical folks. So it's a very practical 
problem solving tool that helps you encapsulate the life cycle of an analysis. And, but don't get, but you know, the key thing is they're bringing best practices like version control, but in doing so, they're actually solving a life cycle problem for, you know, an analysis that ends up in a non, someone non-technical's hands and making sure you can trace that back to the code that the original developer wrote. All right. Well, with that, thank you so much, Chris. This has been fun. Yeah, this is great. Thanks for having me.